So I'm really pleased to welcome Iftar al to Cardiff. Um, he's a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, specializes in political theory and history of political thought, in particular political ideas in the Enlightenment period and how they might enrich contemporary conversations about politics. He works on a number of different questions, including the appropriation and distortion of Republican ideas by nationalists, the challenges posed to Republicanism by the Scottish Enlightenment. And today he's going to discuss Richard Price, the Republican Goliath. So, Christ of Canesity, if that. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, Price's Republicanism. Uh, Price um, has been playing an increasingly visible role in the so-called Republican revival. And um, for scholars of Price, this uh, presents a bit of a challenge or a conundrum. Um, Price was accused by many of his critics of being a Republican uh, or a Democrat, which amounted to the same thing, given that democracy was understood to be a form of republic. Uh, to pick just a couple of examples, um, member of the House of Lords, George Pitt, uh, described Price's observations on the nature of civil liberty as a flaming pamphlet full of Republican doctrines. Uh, Dean Tucker uh, referred to Price as the celebrated Republican, Dr. Price, or the Republican Goliath himself, uh, the title of my talk. And in response uh, to these accusations, uh, Price issued several denials of his uh, republicanism, or alleged republicanism. In 1778, he protested against being considered as an advocate for a pure democracy and reiterated his preference for such a constitution as our own. Uh, in 1784, he declared having no general preference of a republican constitution of government. In 1787, he added that he is so far from preferring a government purely republican that he considers the British constitution as better adapted than any other to this country, and in theory, excellent. And finally, in 1790, uh, he wrote in a letter, I think it very hard to be charged, as I am now, with being a Republican after repeatedly in my publications declaring the contrary. The question then is whether it is fair to side with Price's critics and consider him to have been a Republican despite his own declarations and protestations to the contrary. Resolving this question seems significant to understanding Price's ideas and situating them in the context of the period and in the longer story uh, of the development of political thought. No less importantly, uh, it invites us to clarify our understanding of what it means to be a Republican, drawing on the concrete context of the exchange between Price and his critics. Now, two of the best scholars of Price have weighed down on this issue. Uh, David Thomas argued that Price should not be considered a Republican. Uh, he explained that the term implied in Price's time hostility uh, toward an exclusion of monarchy, and Price harbored no anti-monarchical sentiments, according to Thomas. Paul Frame has written that Price is ambiguous about revolutionary republicanism, expressing republican sentiments in wishing for the Americans to live without bishops, without nobles, and without kings, that's a quote, and yet claiming not to favor Republican government in Britain. Frames, Frames speculates that Price either privately held Republican sentiments and dared not air them in public, or he believed that Republican government fit only peoples of particular characteristics and circumstances. So there is something to be said for all the above. I would like to follow a slightly different route, uh, take at face value uh, Price's public uh, statements on this topic, assume that he was not being disingenuous, and yet argue that his critics got it right in considering him to be a Republican. I see three possible ways of making this argument. 
uh, by focusing on his doctrine of improvement, uh, by focusing on his conception of individual liberty, and by focusing on his account of free government. I'm going to try and explore the third route, but let me first say something about the first two. So, improvement. Price was well known in his time for his doctrine of the improvement and emancipation of humanity. In its final form, um, formulated in the 1780s, this doctrine laid down a narrative of a revolution of liberty, ignited in America, set ablaze in France, and eventually engulfing the whole world. Um, this revolution was supposed to establish a system of perfect liberty, religious as well as civil, as Price writes in the observations on the importance of the American Revolution. Now, Price says there that the governments of the United States are the first states under heaven in which forms of government have been established favorable to universal liberty. So it would be rather natural to interpret him as saying that as the world progresses and material and social equality increase, Britain too will adopt a similar republican form of government. On this reading then, Price is a republican in the sense of expecting the world to become republican one day. I think that Price did have that expectation, and yet his comment that the British Constitution is, in theory, excellent, suggests that Britain need not necessarily become a country without nobles and kings in order to be free. So if that possibility holds, we have yet to determine whether and in what sense Price is a Republican. I'm moving on to Price's idea of individual liberty. Um, Price is an articulate writer on what uh, Philip Pettit has called non-domination. Uh, in particular, Price argues that the possession of civil liberty requires more than the absence of oppression. It requires the presence of constitutional conditions that protect individuals and communities from being subject to the arbitrary power of others. However, civil liberty, as Price understands it, cannot be reduced to non-domination. It is more accurately understood in terms of self-government. There's much to say about Price's original and sophisticated account of self-government. Here, I will only say that we can think of it rather abstractedly as horizontally and vertically structural. Horizontally, to be a self-governing agent means having the capacity for being a source of spontaneous actions, as well as enjoying structural conditions that secure and further empower the exercise of the capacity. So to give an example, uh, in order to be a free agent internally, I should have a free and, and rational will, but I should also have such constitution of character, as Price says, that would enable me to exercise that will and not be dominated by my passions. Vertically, this combination of spontaneity and structure replicates itself on several le levels of agency. The internal self-government of individuals, their self-government as members of a community of individuals, the internal self-government of the community, and the self-government of communities as members of a community of communities. So the different levels are interdependent. Being a free person is ultimately the effect of the proper constitution and operation of this entire multi-level social structure of self-government. While I think that this is an interesting way of thinking about Republican liberty in general, what makes it distinctly Republican cannot be merely the conception of individual liberty involved here. Historically, not only Republicans thought of individual liberty in terms of non-domination or self-government, what truly distinguishes Republican writers on liberty is the argument that the freedom of citizens is constituted by the distinctive structural features of a free Republican community. So this points us, in particular, to Price's account of free government. So I'm getting to the third route, looking at Price's account of government. 
uh, and if we look to this account, um, one way of resolving the republicanism question um, would look something like this. It would involve a distinction that Price makes between two questions. What are the principles of free government, and what is the best form of government? So we might say that Price insisted on Republican principles of free government uh, and believed that they could be made compatible in the British context with a form of government not purely Republican. So this way of describing things is not entirely my own. A view following similar lines uh, can be found in a pamphlet published in 1777, which invokes the authority of the great Dr. Price and other modern writers of Whig principles, such as Locke and Sidney. And the author of this pamphlet claims that the English Constitution is framed entirely on Republican principles, but denies that a form of government, purely Republican, ought to be established in this kingdom. To see why this might make sense, let's briefly consider Price's thoughts on the principles and the forms of government. The principles of free government can be nicely summed up by one statement that Price makes. Civil government, as far as it can be denominated free, is the creature of the people. Um, so we can break this down a little bit more. Free government derives its authority from the people, and the, its power is a public trust intended to promote the common good of the people, most importantly, the common good of liberty. Free government must be a government by laws and not by men, as Price says, uh, which would make liberty constitutionally secure against being taken away at the pleasure of the government. The people must be able to frame and to choose the government, as well as to continuously direct and control it. As Price famously and controversially puts it, in every free state, every man is his own legislator. Finally, free government relies on the public virtue of its citizens or their vigilance and readiness to resist abuses of power by the government. So I'll come back to this, but these in broad outlines are the principles of free government. Now, what are the best forms of government? Price simply says that there are different modes in which the people choose to direct their affairs. And he is interested in this context, primarily in two issues, representation and mixed government, both of which he thinks are theoretically giving the right form compatible with the principles of free government. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to, to both things, um, but first I'd like to say that parts of all this, the principles and the forms, seem uncontroversial to many of Price's critics. Uh, for instance, the assumption that the power of government is entrusted to it by the people to promote their common good, or the assumption that the people have a right to resist oppression. So these were common Whig ideas, and many of the critics who were Whig rather than Tory uh, were fine with all that. What they deemed to be dangerously Republican was primarily Price's desire to empower the people through representative government. In a nutshell, Price was arguing that for a representative government to be free, it must approximate the idea of, uh, or the ideal rather, of um, uh, direct participation in small states. So how would we do that in representative government? By uh, requiring all sufficiently independent members of the community to, to be able to freely choose independent representatives who are accountable to them and who follow their instructions. Setting aside the objection of the critics to republicanism, it is difficult not to see their point in arguing that Price was a republican based on these principles and based on his theory of representation. His account of free government includes the ideas of the common good of liberty the rule of law, public virtue, and most damningly in their eyes, popular self-government or popular sovereignty. Price actually talks about the omnipotence of the people. 
This is a configuration of ideas that is unmistakably Republican. Coupled with Price's democratic interpretation of the representative form of government, he does seem to be offering a clear statement of democratic republicanism. Notice that Price's only defense against the charge is to insist on his preference of a mixed form of government, as he says, in Britain. So we could rest here and conclude that Price's critics were right in pointing out that his principles were Republican, even if he was right in pointing out that he is not a Republican in the narrow sense of attacking, like Thomas Paine, the institution of monarchy in Britain. However, I think we should not rest here, but rather take a closer look at Price's particular understanding of mixed government. I think we will find that this only strengthens the case for his republicanism. If we take a look at Price's earlier statements on mixed government in his two pamphlets on civil liberty, two points are worth noting. First, the endorsement of mixed government is not something that he is pulling out of his hat in reply to critics. When he first lays down his theory in the observations on the nature of civil liberty, he already states that there may be the best reasons, as he says, for joining to the representative assembly a hereditary council consisting of men of the first rank in the state and, I, I'm quoting, a supreme executive magistrate. My second observation is that when Goodrick, whom I've already mentioned, a tax price for promoting democratic government, Price's immediate response in the additional observations is to refer the readers to Jean-Louis Delhomme's widely read and admired Constitution of England. This work, Price says, contains, I'm quoting, one of the best plans for uniting to an equal and perfect liberty, the greatest wisdom in deliberating and resolving, and the greatest union force and expedition in executing. This invites us to read Delhomme through the eyes of Price and consider what the dissenting minister might have found to be of value in this work. Price's comments certainly echo Delhomme's argument that the division of the legislative power improves the quality of decision making. Uh, they also echo uh, Delhomme's argument that the unity of the executive power in the hands of the king makes it simultaneously more efficient and more easily restrained by the laws. We can also reasonably assume that Price was sympathetic to Delon's argument that the English Constitution gives the monarch only a passive share in the legislature, while providing the people with an unprecedented advantage by lodging the power of proposing laws in the hands of their representatives. So, to say this more briefly and more simply, Delon says that, yes, the monarchy in England is part of the legislature, but it plays a passive role uh, in the legislative branch. And on the other hand, it does have a lot of power in its executive role, but in that role, uh, it is subordinate to the laws made by the parliament. In Price's mind, such an understanding of mixed government could be combined with his principles of free government. What he seems to have missed is that Delon himself was not at all enthusiastic about involving the people at large in the business of making laws. In a pamphlet that he published in 1780, entitled An Essay on Constitutional Liberty, Delon criticizes Price and Bolingbroke, describing them as modern demagogues who have disseminated Republican doctrines and sub substituted Republican for constitutional liberty, drawing on the principles of Republicanism outlined by Harrington and by Montesquieu, he faults the modern Republicans with attempting to promote political equality without the requisite redistribution of property and cultivation of the love of equality. He adds that they are wrong or disingenuous in thinking that their schemes of liberty are compatible with monarchy. The point, I think, is not that Price was disingenuous or wrong in thinking that his schemes of liberty are compatible with monarchy. The point is that 
when you start from his principles of free government and add on to them his understanding of the representative form of government, and then add on to that his uh, uh, understanding of a hereditary monarch acting primarily as a supreme executive, you get what many contemporaries, including Republicans like John Adams, would have described as a republic. Thus, I would prefer to conclude that Price's critics rightly recognized something that he was reluctant to see. What he was describing was really a democratic republic, perhaps hiding under the forms of representative and mixed government, but clearly not at all hiding too well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dechavar Iftach. Um, so just to um, explain the drill, perhaps for those who are joining us uh, remotely as well, um, I've got a microphone in here where I can take questions from the floor. If you'd like to ask a question remotely, please uh, put your hands up from the reactions icon or just pop a message in the chat. Um, is there anybody here, first of all, in the room that would like to put the question to Iftach? Randy. Hi, my mind was racing during your talk. Maybe some of that was the extra cappuccino. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about how I mean Richard Price was also pragmatic, and how his shape of republicanism and his contemporaries was driven by um, the oppression and bloodshed that they saw. Because I think a lot of the sense of republicanism may have come from that Cromwell era and the oppression and excesses of the few years that Great Britain was a republic. And um, I, I'd like to hear from Price now. He died at just the wrong moment because um, I think there was a lot of sympathy for the French Revolution. Um, I'm more familiar with some of the thinking of his nephew and protege, William Morgan, who lived longer and saw it turn to bloodshed. And that, that chilled the, um, the rational dissenters within the UK. Um, you know, fast forward to modern day, um, you look at the American form of republic and you get uh, pockets of tyranny in places like Texas and Florida that come from what a Republican system can come with enough corruption to it. Um, so what do you have to say about um, how oppression and bloodshed gets mixed into the recipe? So I take it that um, you're asking about the possibility of oppression and bloodshed under Republican forms of, uh, of government. Because oppression and bloodshed in general, I mean, Price was very much you know, in favor of uh, you know, establishing perpetual peace by uh, you know, founding all states on Republican principles, and then also founding associations of states that would protect them from external oppression and domination. So it's kind of a picture of a world order of the kind of that we find in uh, Kant's uh, uh, essay on perpetual peace. Um, but you know, the worry did, does exist and did exist um, uh, that uh, there would be uh, oppression and domination even under Republican governments. I and mean, one of the people who raised that worry was uh, Price's acquaintance, John Adams, who is also, as far as I know, the first person use the term the tyranny of the majority. Uh, and, uh, and, and Adams did um, criticize uh, Price for what he thought was his uh, neglect of this uh, problem uh, in his defense of the constitutions of the United States. Um, and, and Price uh, replies to Adams uh, in a letter that uh, he does think that there is a uh, value in the, in the mixed form of government for that reason, in order to 
to provide checks and balances in the legislature, as, as he says there. Um, I'll add to that, that that Price in the 1780s was seized with the conviction that the world is progressing toward a better place and that almost inevitably what we would call enlightenment in the sense of you know, the light of uh, reason is, is spreading. The, the true principles of freedom and government uh, that you know, first uh, took concrete form in America will now spread to France and to uh, the rest of the world. Um, so obviously, he, he was lucky enough to live exactly in that moment uh, <laughs> where all that seemed very possible. Thank you. Uh, we've got one question from our virtual audience. Malcolm, um, can I get a question? I think Malcolm is. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Well, well let me start by saying Bokotov Mirushalayim, which being translated as Borida or Garsalim, or in other words, good morning from Jerusalem, where, where I live as a Welshman. Uh, so my, I would like to suggest the following. If, um, if uh, Price were able to come back today and to watch and to learn the evolution of the British constitution since his time up to the present, uh, wouldn't he be able to say, I was right? In other words, uh, to keep the, keep the monarchy, but to insist on these various principles uh, that, that he mentioned. Uh, and uh, in that way, the monarchy has, has survived in Britain, where it's been lost in other countries. Uh, and on the other hand, its uh, function has become increasingly formal r rather than uh, uh, executive, and yet nonetheless uh, maintaining a useful role in, in the development of the constitution. So uh, my question is, would Price today uh, be able to say, see, I was right? Uh Yes, I think so. But uh, let me add, may, perhaps a little bit more controversially, uh, that ha he probably would have thought that uh, the Loam's vision of a supreme executive magistrate uh, is uh, realized in the United States. I mean, it's true that the you know hereditary monarch uh, was replaced with an elective monarch, uh, but otherwise, uh, more or less uh, fits. That uh, that vision. Um, so yes, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Well, as I would suggest that in the United States, the elected monarch has has retained the powers of a monarch in the 18th century, whereas in Britain, uh, the constitution has been able to e evolve beyond that, and we see in the United States. Uh, certain abuses of power by the elected monarchs. For example, uh, granting pardons to criminals who don't deserve them. And this is something which the monarch in Britain no, no longer can do. I totally agree, which is why I bring the, the example of the United States. Because uh, if, if we take seriously the idea that, that Price was persuaded by the Loan's idea that uh, there should be an executive monarch holding uh, considerable power, then that vision is actually realized in the United States rather than in the UK. Jehovah Malcolm, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, we've got a question from the floor here now from Marion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I enjoyed that so much. Um, first of all, of course, memories of Cromwell do crop up a lot, and it does play a role, but it also plays a role because we have a lot of millenarianism in the 1790s. And of course, for the millenarians, Cromwell's Republic was not of God. That's why it had to fall. And you get this, I mean, I find this in my, uh, you know, there are a lot of Baptists who are dissenters and, you know, a lot of work has been done on this. So that's, that's you know, that's, um, 
it's, it's quite powerful. Um, and of course, they greet the French Revolution because uh, it is of God and it's overthrowing the whole of Babylon and all that. So that's just about Cromwell. But what I was, you know, I completely agree that Price was fortuitous when he lived, that moment in time, as he said, and when he died. Uh, and I think it was actually fortuitous for him that he did die when he, when he did, because I think he drew on a different concept of revolution. And, the, and, and, and of republicanism. The concept of the republic was changing, if we believe Kozilek, uh, for instance. Um, and I wonder, I'm not a philosopher, uh, and I wonder whether he actually drew on the concept of republicanism as, you know, in the ancient republics. Uh, when and he, whether he was informed, you know, he, he writes his observations in 1776 when the concept of the Republic is still something, you know, it's the ancient republics, and they did have, you know, we, some kind of mixed government. Um, so I, I wonder, I don't know whether, what you could say about that? Uh, I entirely agree. Uh, the concepts were changing, the concept of uh, a Republic, the concept of democracy. Um, I'm, I, I just like to point out that, that the idea that there could be a Republic with a mixed form of government, and it was, was in the air, I mean, was in the air prior, prior to Price. Um, I mean, Rousseau says similar things, only Rousseau believes that the people should retain the legislative uh, power. Uh, John Adams says very similar uh, things. Um, so yes, um, I, I would like to say one more thing about the, um, perhaps, how Price would have seen things had he lived to see the, the terror. Uh, so here, Alan, you will correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but uh, I, I'm taken by the way um, in which uh, Wollstonecraft responded to the French Revolution. Uh, Wollstonecraft, uh, who had Price as a friend and a mentor. Um, as, she, as I understand her in, in her uh, 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 work on the French Revolution, uh, she says that you know the preferable way for things to to happen is you know for the light of reason uh, to engulf us and you know for uh, for humanity to progress in a gradual and peaceful way. But you know when we have the sort of oppression that cannot be shaken off and by other means, then a violent revolution may be necessary. And I think she thought it was necessary. In the, in the case of the French Revolution, and perhaps Price would have thought the same. The inevitable, not, not, not just necessary. Right. It can't be badly stopped. Though. Yeah. Yeah, please, Alan. Um, are you want to follow up with a question as well, Alan? Oh, OK, yeah, thanks. Um, um, OK, thank you very much. That was, the, that was a masterclass in clarity. That, that's uh, very helpful and um, very persuasive. Um, I, I'm interested in his idea of self-government and whether he addresses in any way, um, th th there's a problem that Catherine McCauley, who has a similar uh, system, sort of identified, which is the, the, the tension between the, the internal uh, self-government, which is you, you're independent of mind because you are governed under reason rather than by your, your passions or prejudices, the external prejudices or your own. Um, and then you've got uh, an account of um, the conditions necessary to allow that, and you talk about independent people being allowed to, to, to exercise their, their, you know, their, their wills um, and spontaneous actions and, and so on. And that tends to be monitored by something like um, uh, property or you know, not, you know, being in a, in a, in a non-dependent sort of condition of, of, of some sort. So we can sort of assess who is suitable to be considered independent in that way. Yeah. But, what Macaulay notices is that a lot of the people who are declared independent for that are simply not independent of mind, because they're either corrupted by luxury, or they're corrupted by the prevailing slavish ideas in, in, in society, or they're corrupted by the structure of motivations, which means standing up on principle marks you out as a, as a, a dupe to be kind of mocked and shunned by people who think, yeah, why are you standing on principle when you could be subverting it, and so on. Um, so it seems that there's a lot of reasons why, when you look at someone and say, well, he's independent, he can vote, or, or whatever, that's actually not an internally independent person. 
So, so there's a kind of internal problem between identifying, you know, if you just look at the external qualifications, you're, you're actually missing out on creating true independence. And, and she believes that, that something like it, uh, it, immutable principles, reason will win out, and, and, and so on. And, and I, I would have thought Price would have a similar sort of view, but I wondered if he ever sort of grapples with that issue. Um, not sufficiently. I mean, he has some thoughts about uh, education. And clearly, he thinks that, again, the, the light of reason can spread by example. Uh, so the works of people like himself influence the work of government in America, for example. And then you know, government is also an example that people can, can learn from. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Macaulay, and even more than Macaulay, Wollstonecraft were so much better at uh, thinking about those issues, how we are kind of enslaved by, um, uh, by social corruption, uh, one, one can say. Uh, so yes, in, in that way, they sort of uh, continue and complement him in, in ways that I think that uh, he didn't fully appreciate. Wonderful. Yeah. It is tricky, that, isn't it? Dear <laughs> Val, thank you, Yiftach. I, I think that's for the, the questions for, for now. Um, I can say, having listened to the talk, <coughs> that I understand so much more now that passage in the Discourse on the Love of Our Country where he addresses the king and he puts the king in his place, as it, as it were. <laughs> and um, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, what do you think of the mon monarchy today? I think one of the things that is missing in terms of our attitude towards the monarchy with respect to Price's attitude in that text is we do not regard the king as our first servant and we do not see his majesty being our majesty. So although I think structurally there's a lot to say that that monarch is one that might fit with Price's view of things, I wonder psychologically whether the British people have quite got to the same place as, as Price, but um, that's something further to discuss. I know that you're working on a book on Richard Price, so we, I think we're all really looking forward to seeing the fruits of your labour there. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise Thanks with us this much. morning. Thanks very much.